one, a thin uniform bar has a moment of inertia I about an axis perpendicular to it through its center. If both the mass and the length of this bar are doubled, the moment of inertia about the same axis will be 2i, 4i, 8i, or 16i. Let's take a look. All right, let's see what happens when we double the mass and double the length here. So if I double the mass and double the length, length is a squared term, so I have a two and a four, that gives me eight times the moment of inertia. Correct answer, C. Correct answer, C, yes. Number two, you are designing a wheel that must be have a fixed mass and diameter but you can have the mass distribution in various uniform ways. If the torque you exert on it is also fixed, which of the wheels shown will have the smallest angular acceleration about an axis perpendicular to its center? So we're looking at these four wheels. Let's take a look. All right, given the same torque, we want the one with the smallest angular acceleration. So that's gonna be the one with the largest moment of inertia. And the moment of inertia gets larger if the mass is further from the axis rotation. So we're gonna want the one where that mass is as far out as it can be. That is gonna be that thin walled kind of cylinder looking one, um, C. Yes, the correct answer there is C. Number three. Two equal masses, M, are connected by a very light string over a frictionless pulley of mass, M over two. The system has been given a push to get it moving as shown, but the push is no longer acting. In which segment of the string is the tension greater, A or B, or are they the same? Let's take a look. All right, the key word in this one is constant velocity. So constant velocity tells me then that the acceleration is going to be zero, specifically the angular acceleration here. It also tells me then that the sum of the torques is also going to be zero. That means when I add up the two torques, I add up tension from A times its radius plus the tension from B times its radius and one of those is in the negative direction. Which one's in the negative direction there? B is in the negative direction, so we'll put a little minus sign in there. We should get zero, and so what we're gonna find out is TA equals TB. So they have the same tension, so the correct answer is C. Correct answer is C. All right, number four. A weight W swings from a hook in the ceiling by a light string of length L, as shown in the diagram. T is the tension in the string, when the string makes an angle theta with the vertical, the net torque about the hook is? All right, let's see how to calculate this. Okay, to find torque, we need to find the perpendicular, the component of the force, times its distance from the axis rotation. So our axis rotation is up here at the top. Our force causing torque is mg, um, but only the mg sine theta component is perpendicular. You'll notice tension is not perpendicular, so it is not producing any torque. Um, instead of mg, they choose weight, so we have w times the sine of the angle, and the distance from the axis rotation to the ball is the length of that object. Correct answer there, C. Correct answer, w sine theta. A string is wrapped around the outer rim of a solid uniform cylinder that is free to rotate about a frictionless axle through its center. When the string is pulled with a force P tangent to the rim, it gives the cylinder an angular acceleration alpha. If the cylinder had twice the radius, but the mass and the force were the same, the angular acceleration would be, all right, let's take a look. All right, so we got this disc being pulled by this force. It's causing an angular acceleration because this force is producing a torque. Now they wanna know what happens if we double the radius and everything else stays the same. Okay, so I have force times the radius. You'll notice that is perpendicular, so it's producing the torque there. Um, it is a disc, so 1 half mr squared times alpha. The problem, oops, I should make that a capital R. The problem here is the radius of the disc is also impacting this. So we see that one of these radiuses cancels off. Um, let's go ahead and solve for alpha. So I have 2F divided by MR is equal to alpha. And so if I go ahead and actually double that radius, even though it's producing more torque, 
Um, there's a larger moment of inertia, and because moment inertias are squared, that has a bigger influence, and so the acceleration actually decreases by a factor of two. Correct answer there, C. Correct answer, C. Number six, a glider of mass M on a frictionless horizontal track is connected to an object M2 by a massless string. The glider accelerates to the right, the object accelerates downward, and the string rotates a pulley with a moment of inertia I. What is the relationship among tension T1, the horizontal part of the string, T2, the vertical part of the string, and the weight M2G of the object? Let's take a look. All right, so we have this situation where all of this stuff is accelerating this way because there is a force pulling down here and there's no friction holding this cart from back. So it's only got tension one, so it's definitely going to accelerate. That means everything else is going to accelerate. We're gonna use that to figure out which forces are larger. Because whenever it's accelerating, that means it's a second law. That means we have unbalanced forces. One has to be larger than the other. The direction of the acceleration always points toward the larger force. So that means mg is going to be larger than T2. Up here, when I start to do with torque, it's very similar. Um, since they both have the same radius there, um, we know that the T2 torque has to be larger. So I know that T2 times R has to be larger than T1 times R, but the R's cancel, so I just see that T2 is larger than T1. And so then I can say, oh, well then, T1 has to be smaller than T2, so T2 has to be larger than T1. And so the correct answer there, D. Correct answer, D there. Number seven, a lightweight string is wrapped several times around the rim of a small hoop. If the free end of the string is held in place and the hoop is released from rest, the string unwinds and the hoop descends. How does the tension in the string compare with the weight of the hoop? Let's take a look. Okay, similar to the last one, this is going to accelerate down. So because it's accelerating down, I do know that mg must be larger than tension. Correct answer, C. Yes, the tension will be less than the weight. Correct answer, C. Number eight, a solid bowling ball rolls down a ramp. Which of the following forces exerts a torque on the bowling ball about its center? Let's take a look. All right, so. We have this bowling ball, it's on this incline, what's producing torque? So there actually isn't any torque from the normal force because it's parallel with the radius, not perpendicular, so no torque from the normal force. Mg doesn't produce any torque because its distance from the axis rotation is zero. And then lastly, we do have force of friction, which is a distance away and perpendicular, so torque from the force of friction is the only torque acting on that bowling ball. Correct answer, C. Number nine, a yo-yo is placed on a horizontal surface as shown. There is sufficient friction for the yo-yo to roll without slipping. If the string is pulled to the right as shown in the picture, what does the yo-yo do? Let's take a look. All right, so I see that both the pulling force and the force of friction are producing clockwise torques on my yo-yo here. And so because they're both trying to rotate it that way, that is the direction it will rotate. So the alpha will be clockwise as well. Correct answer there. Correct answer, A. All right, let's change it up a little bit. Number 10, a yo-yo is placed on a horizontal surface shown in the figure, but now the force is at the bottom of the center. Let's take a look at how this impacts it. Ah, so you got stumped. So we have one force trying to rotate it this way, and then we have the force of friction trying to rotate it that way. So which way is it going to rotate? Let's take a closer look at it in action, and then we'll actually solve to see which way will it rotate? All right, so we see we got the yo-yo here. We're gonna pull on that bottom edge and you'll see that it does actually roll back up. So let's go ahead and calculate why that is. All right, so we did see that it rotated and rolled this direction and actually like rolled itself back up, which was kind of cool. So let's go ahead and solve for why this is. So the sum of the forces equals MA. So I'm gonna call the acceleration A in this direction, and this is the angular acceleration. Both of those I do need to make positive so that I can make the relationship that alpha is equal to A over R work. Okay, so I'm gonna add up the forces in the 
x direction, so I have force minus force of friction equals ma. I'm gonna add up the torques. So I have this force now, I just threw some numbers together to see what this would be like. So I called this half the radius and I called this the full radius. I'm also going to assume that the I value for this, this is a disc. So this isn't gonna give us a definitive answer for a yo-yo necessarily, um, based on that half the R type thing, but it's gonna give us kind of a ballpark as to what's gonna happen. So I do see with this scenario, um, that I do get all of these R's to cancel. I'm gonna go ahead, solve for the force of friction over here, substitute it in. So I have negative F over two plus F minus MA equals one half MA. So I'm gonna add that MA over to the other side, combine these together. So this makes a one half force equals a three halves MA the halves cancel out, and so I actually get a force divided by 3m will tell you the acceleration of that yo-yo, and it does come out to be a positive number, so it will be accelerating to the right. So here the correct answer is C. Yes, the correct answer there, the yo-yo rolls to the right and winds itself back up. Interesting. Number 11, the yo-yo is placed again on the same surface, but now we're pulling up. Okay, let's take a look. All right, so when we pull up on that string, we see that we end up with two clockwise torques again. If both torques are clockwise, the angular acceleration will definitely be clockwise. C, correct answer there. Correct answer A there. Number 12, two blocks are joined by a light string that passes over the pulley, shown in the right, which has a radius R and a moment of inertia I about its center. T1 and T2 are the tensions of the string on either side of the pulley, and alpha is the angular acceleration of the pulley. Which of the following equations best describes the pulley's rotational motion during the time the blocks accelerate? All right, let's take a look. All right, so based on the picture, it does look like this mass is a little bigger, so I'm gonna assume it's gonna accelerate to the right, um, and I see tension T2 times its radius is gonna be its torque, in the positive direction, whereas tension one times its radius in the negative direction. So this is the equation I get. Um, they do factor out an R, um, but it's D. Is that correct? Correct answer, D. Number 13, an object will reach the bottom of, which object will reach the bottom of the ramp first if released at the same time, a hoop or a disc, or will it be a tie? Let's take a look. All right, let's see who wins the disc hoop race. Disc wins! Disc wins! Disc! Disc! Good job, disc. All right. Number 14. Ball A and ball B have the same mass. Ball A is attached to the string, which is wrapped around a solid disc, which is mounted on a frictionless pivot. Ball B has a string, which is wrapped around a hollow disc. Okay, so we have a solid disc and hollow disc. Both the discs have the same mass. If ball A and ball B are dropped from the same height, which ball will have more kinetic energy when it reaches the ground, A or B. All right, let's take a look. Okay, so we have a disc and a hoop. The hoop has the larger moment of inertia, so there's gonna be less kinetic energy left over for the ball because more energy is gonna have to go into rotating the hoop. Correct answer there would be A. Correct answer, ball A, yes. Number 15. You are designing a flywheel to store large amounts of kinetic energy. Which of one of the following uniform shapes will be the most effective for storing the greatest amount of kinetic energy if all the objects have the same mass and same angular velocity? So we're looking for the largest kinetic energy with the same omega. That means the one with the largest moment of inertia is gonna have the largest kinetic energy stored in it. So if I look down those shapes, I look at their moments of inertia, I see that the thin-walled hollow cylinder at mr squared has the largest I value, so the correct answer is C. Correct answer, the thin-walled hollow cylinder, yes. Number 16, four uniform objects having the same mass and diameter are released simultaneously from rest at the same distance above the bottom of a hill and roll down without slipping. We have another race ahead of us here. The objects are a solid sphere, a solid cylinder, a hollow cylinder, and a thin-walled hollow cylinder. Which of these objects will be the first one to reach the bottom? Let's take a look. 
So we're looking to see which one's gonna go the fastest. So the one with the lowest moment of inertia is gonna require the least amount of energy to rotate it. That means the most amount of translational kinetic energy will be left at the end. So if I look through that list of objects, the solid sphere has the lowest I value, so that will be moving the fastest. The correct answer there, A. Yes, that solid sphere does get there first. Number 17, four uniform objects. Okay, so we got the same setup. Which one's gonna be the last one to reach the bottom of the hill? Let's take a look. So we're trying to find the slowest one, so it's kind of the inverse of the last problem we did. So we're looking for the largest I value will give us the lowest amount of translational kinetic energy because the most amount of energy is going into rotating it. Therefore, it will be moving the slowest. Correct answer there is the thin-walled hollow cylinder D. Yes, that thin-walled hollow cylinder is the last one. Number 18, for the objects in the previous question, which of the following statements is correct? All right, let's take a look. All right, for this one, because they all start with the same amount of potential energy at the top, they're all gonna end with the same amount of total kinetic energy at the bottom. It's just some of them have more of that energy in rotation and more or more in translation. It's how that's divvied up that decides who wins that race. So yes, they have the same amount of potential, so the same amount of kinetic at the end. So the correct answer there, B. Yes, B, all of these objects have the same total amount of kinetic energy at the bottom of the hill. Number 19, the three objects have the same mass and radius. Each object is rotating about an axis of symmetry shown in blue. All three objects have the same rotational kinetic energy. Which one is rotating the fastest? All right, so because they all have the same kinetic energy rotational, um, the one with the smallest I is going to have the largest omega. So the one with the smallest I there is the solid sphere. And so the correct answer is B. Yes, the solid sphere. Number 20. A sphere of mass M and radius R and rotational inertia I is released from rest at the top of an inclined plane of height H as shown above. Well, there is no picture. If the plane is frictionless, okay, so we got a frictionless incline, what is the speed VCM of the center of mass of the sphere at the bottom of the incline? Let's take a look. Oh, being get fooled on that one, no friction being the key there. So we set up the work kinetic energy theorem, we see that the gravitational potential energy turns into the kinetic energy, which has two parts, translational, rotational. Because there's no friction, it's not going to rotate, so there's no rotational kinetic energy at the bottom. So we just have mgh equals one half mv squared. We get v is equal to square root of two gh. Correct answer, A. Yes, the correct answer is A. Again, yes, frictionless surface, square root of two gh. All right, same scenario this time, except for now we do have friction. So now it is going to roll. Let's take a look. Now we do have friction in this one, so there will be rotational kinetic energy. So we can set up our equation. So I got mgh equals one half mv squared plus one half i omega squared. But I'm gonna make that substitution of v squared over r squared um, for omega squared there because it is rolling without slipping. Um, probably make that a capital R, I believe they do. Okay, so now I just need to go ahead and solve for v. <clears throat> so I'm going to multiply everything by 2, so I get 2mgh. I'm going to factor out a v squared, so I have m plus i over r squared times v squared. Go ahead, pull that down to the other side, and take the square root, so I get 2mgh divided by m plus i over r squared, square rooted, equals v. Um, this is the correct answer. Um, they do have it in a different format. They went ahead and multiplied everything by r squared. Um, so you didn't have a fraction in the denominator, heaven forbid. Um, so we are gonna go with the correct answer of E on this one. Correct answer there is E. All right, E is the correct answer. A ring and a disc of, with identical mass, radii, and velocities are not attached to each other. If the ring and the disc then roll without slipping up an incline, how will the distances that they move up the plane before coming to rest compare? Let's take a look. Okay, so we have these two things. They're rolling. They have the same amount of 
speed, but they're gonna have different amounts of kinetic energy. So the ring has the larger I value, which is gonna give it an overall larger kinetic energy, even though they have the same translational kinetic energy. Because that I value is larger, but their omegas are the same, this part of the kinetic energy is gonna be larger for the ring, so overall larger kinetic energy, meaning it has overall more energy, so when it gets, it will roll higher up that ramp and have a larger gravitational potential energy as a result. So the correct answer there, A. Yes, A, the ring will move further than the disc. Number 23, a spinning figure skater pulls his arms in as he rotates on the ice. As he pulls his arms in, what happens to his angular momentum L and kinetic energy K? Let's take a look. All right, so we got our figure skater pulling their arms in and spinning faster, and we wanna know what happens to their angular momentum and the kinetic energy. So because there's no real friction, we can say there's no net external torque, therefore angular momentum is conserved. And I'm just gonna throw some numbers on here. So if we half our I value, that's not gonna happen. It's gonna be a lot smaller than that, or a lot less change than that. So if we half the I value, that means they're going to double their omega for L to be conserved. If we do that same thing, so we have half the I, but it doubles the omega, that overall increases the kinetic energy by a factor of two. So we see the angular momentum staying constant and we see the kinetic energy increasing. This is because as they pull their arms in, there is a force that's required to make that go in a circular motion. And so they are applying that force times a displacement, so they are doing work in, in causing that rotation to increase in kinetic energy. So the correct answer there, B. Correct answer, B, the momentum stays the same and the kinetic energy increases. Number 24, disc X rotates freely with an angular velocity omega on a frictionless bearings as shown below or to the right, I guess. A second identical disc, Y, initially not rotated, is placed on X so that both discs rotate together without slipping. When the discs are rotating together, which of the following is half of what it was before? All right, let's take a look. All right, so there's no net external torques on our situation. One of them is rotating initially, one of them is not. So we have the I omega before and afterwards they're gonna rotate together at some final omega prime. So they have the same I value, so we combine those to be two I. We can cross out an I, divide the two over, and I see that the final angular velocity is going to be half of the initial angular velocity. Correct answer there, C. Yes, the angular velocity C decreases for X. That's it.